Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. It's great to see everyone here. Uh, it's uh, a great privilege for me to uh, you know, address the, uh, the, you know, the new generation of talent in uh, computer science and, and related disciplines. And it's also a great privilege for me to be the warm-up act for uh, Sir Tony Hoare uh, and Andrew Herbert. So this talk uh, is about strategic thinking for researchers. So strategy is, is about uh, determining the basic long-term goals and objectives of an enterprise and adopting courses of action and allocation of resources necessary to carry out those goals. That's a sort of textbook definition. Uh, another way of putting, about it, putting it in the context of the summer school, you know, you've had talks from Simon PJ about writing great papers, you know, how to define a research topic for a particular paper and do a great job of that, and also how to give great talks to get people motivated to, to read your paper and maybe to, to, to build on that. Um, but so this talk is more about what next, you know, as you kind of, as you know, as you graduate from your PhDs and you, uh, you, you do postdocs and you end up in faculty positions or in research lab positions, um, you're more and more expected to, to completely set your own agenda and to, to find, um, to identify what would be an important thing to, to look at. And so this talk is um, about strategies um, for, for, for doing that. Um, and it's a, it's a bit of an, exact, an inexact science. So. Uh, I feel a bit off the leash in some sense because normally when I give talks, you've got to have a really you know, good argument. This is the, you know, really you know, nailed down a theorem or uh, uh, you know, have a lot of data to, to show that something you know, definitely, you know, the new system you've built is definitely more efficient than something else. But in this talk, I'm, I'm kind of off the leash and uh, putting out various thoughts. I mean, they're not, uh, that are sort of a bit, in, uh, maybe a bit hard to, 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 sort of, to, to, to prove or disprove, but I think I'm putting them forward to you because I think they've, they've, people have found these ideas useful uh, in practice. Um, so a bit of motivation, if, if research is your life, and I think most of us here in this room, you know, that's why we're here. Research has become our lives. We're totally, you know, fascinated by computers and related things, and, you know, we want to, you know, write a dissertation about it. We want to write papers, and ultimately we want to have some sort of impact with that. So I think if, if research is your life, then thinking about strategy as well as the as execution is, is important. But exec by execution, I mean the, the, the individual things of writing particular papers and talks, and strategy is, you know, beyond that. I'm not saying this is particularly original. I've kind of stolen um, slides from other people. I've stolen quotes from lots of people. Uh, so it, it's quite a, an assortment. Um, and as I say, it's not particularly rigorous. You know, I don't think you, you can, maybe you can argue with me, but I don't know if we'd eventually agree one way or the other. And, and certainly I don't think there's one correct strategy, uh, but I think there's some common features. Um, and finally, I was, I was putting all this together. I was thinking, gee, there's a lot of advice here. Does anyone actually follow all of this? And I, I don't know if they do, but I think most people follow some of this advice. So I think it's worth uh, paying attention to. And finally about me, this is somewhat personal, I guess, because uh, it's my personal selection of things. And, uh, of, of tactics that I, I, I believe would work, and, and most of which I have applied myself at one time or another. Um, I, and I, I, why, why do I feel qualified to give this talk? Well, why not? You know, I've been around here for a bit, but also um, a few years ago, uh, for, the, for the last couple of years, we've, we've had events a bit like this for researchers in, uh, in Microsoft, where we've got people together to talk about their strategies for, uh, uh, for, for doing research, and I've, I've drawn from that. So we had two events, and I did this with uh, my colleague, uh, Tora Grapel. Um, we had, so a couple of years ago, we held an impact workshop uh, in this very room. We had about 50 or 60 members of the lab come along, and we had a series of talks on, uh, on, on different strategies. Then we also had a breakout session, and people you know, shared their, 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 their strategies. Um, and this was our opening slide, that what we were trying to do is uh, get together to talk about how to have impact through research, to make us stop and think how our, world, our work might change the world. Um, and that was uh, a lot of fun. We had some good feedback from it. People were pretty energized. The organizers themselves, we, I remember I, I, we wrote down, organizing it was so much fun, it almost didn't feel like work. It was really a, a, a great to, to come together because you know, here you know, we're, we're in a big lab, and I mean, this is true of a university department as well. You know, big institutions like that have, have lots of little groups, and people talk in the little groups, but then barely meet each other uh, 
uh, maybe other people that are sort of on, on the same hallway. So it's actually really good to come together. Um, so, uh, and, and when you do that, it's not just fun. Uh, we think also it can lead to serendipities, to connections. Uh, I mean, some of my best papers, I think, have come because when I was a grad student, I mean, I was a PL person, and I sat in on lots of systems talks, and that gave me ideas for some, some papers that have been quite influential, I think. Um, so c getting together across uh, group boundaries is, uh, I think, a, a good thing. Um, and so, so we organized that, a lot of energy, a lot of fun. So we decided to organize a second event. And this was last year. This was the Microsoft Research Speed Dating Society. So here we try to take uh, an element of the, uh, the original impact day uh, that worked really well, which is people just talking to one another. another. So we, we, we got together. Uh, <laughs> And uh, everyone, the, the idea was to surprise each other and then to have, uh, I can't remember, it was eight, eight speed dates where we, we being geeks, we, we wrote an Excel plugin that took the, name of the people, names of the people who were present and then randomly assigned them to have um, five speed dates from a, across the lab. It was different levels of seniority. Uh, you know, there were interns, there were professors, there were you know, senior researchers and, and across different subjects as well. Um, and it was a lot of fun uh, and we had... Uh, we had great feedback. And the feedback was kind of mixed, actually. Uh, there was one visiting professor who said, Andy, I'm a happily married man. Of course I wouldn't come to your speed dating event. <laughs> so that was maybe a bit of a misunderstanding. Um, but hey, we had, a, uh, we had a morning after survey, just to, you know, were there any regrets, anything worth regretting? No. <laughs> there were few regrets. Pe people had, had really uh, in enjoyed it. Um, and I, I, would, I would definitely do that again. Um, so I think that, you know, so anyway, this is stuff we've done here to try and bring people together and create some serendipities um, and have some fun uh, in the lab. But now let me get to some, some more serious stuff. So uh, strategies for research. I think a basic thing is know what you're trying to do. You know, you go to speak to people who've been successful, you know, in, in terms of a long-term project, you know, over several years and bringing together, um, you know, a you know, big team from, uh, from different disciplines. Then there's usually a leader who's had a clear idea of what they're trying to do. So on the right there, you've got Werner von Braun, a rocket scientist from, from Germany who you know, did, did rockets. You know, that's a heck of an enterprise. Um, and, and he knew what he wanted to do. And he also, about research, is saying, research is what I'm doing when I don't know what I'm doing. So he uh, uh, somehow squared that circle. And Björn Strustrop, uh, the most important single aspect of software development is to be clear about what you're trying to build. So I think, you know, you don't entirely know what you're going to do, but you've got to, at least you know what you're trying to do. So a good job interview question to, to consider if you're on the job market soon is, someone might well ask you, what's the most important in your field, most important problem in your field? I mean, sometimes you think all research is equal. Re all research is not equal. Some problems are more important than others. Some results are going to have wider applicability than others. So I think it's good as we mature as researchers to start thinking about which of the papers that you've seen that are going to have more impact on, on, on other papers or on uh, actual businesses um, and which ones you know, are, are, are not. So what's the most important in your field? And they follow up. The trick one is, what are you working on? Are you actually working on that? Um, sometimes people say, oh, well, I'll just muddle along and, and appeal to serendipity. Serendipity being sort of, you know, the chance connections that people couldn't foresee. And serendipity definitely exists, um, but it, you shouldn't see, about, see it as an excuse for not knowing what you're trying to do. That's Louis Pasteur. He had a famous slogan, chance favors, favors the prepared mind. So chance will certainly help, but you've got to sort of, you've got to know stuff before you can make connections. You've got to have skills before you can make connections. Uh, Richard Hamming, there's a great essay, Richard Cam or a speech that Richard Hamming wrote, Hamming, you know, famous for Hamming numbers, worked at Bell Labs. I recommend you go and, and read on the web called You and Your Research, easy to find. Um, and he said that he spent Friday afternoons, you know, through his career, not doing his regular research, but spending time thinking about what the important problems were. Um, and he said that if, if on those Friday afternoons after a while he realized that um, he should be going in one direction, you know, that was the important area, it was over there, but he... The rest of the week, he was over here doing something different. Eventually, he figured, this is daft. You know, I need to stop doing that and go in the direction that's important. And that's something I think you know, successful researchers do. Uh, they, they change topics. Currently, don't work on unimportant problems. You know, it's, it's good to be opportunistic, um, but don't get carried away. I mean, a classic thing is you go to a conference, you meet a friend or, or, or someone, you've got an idea for a paper, and you get excited about it and go off and write it, but without really thinking about whether this fits into your longer term goals, uh, whether it really is important, so you can get carried away in the heat of the moment. I certainly know that's happened to me. It's in, there's various papers I found that in the end kind of fizzled out. We wrote the paper, but it really went nowhere. And when I think about it, I, I kind of got over, carried away in the heat of the moment 
because we could do this without really thinking where it might, might end. Some concrete examples. So one of our heroes at Microsoft Research is Don Syme. He's in our, in our group, and he's, uh, he's done two amazing tech transfers. And I think he's a nice example of somebody who had a clear vision and pulled people together over a series of years to actually make that happen. So I'll say a little bit about this particular case study. I don't think, has Don spoken at this uh, well, meeting? We've, had a short talk, we we've heard. Short okay, great. So you've heard about this, the stuff he's, he's done. Um, so he joined the lab uh, back in 98, 99. And, uh, at, at that point, .NET was coming out, which is this language runtime. Um, and at that point, it didn't have generics, you know, sort of like generic collection types. Um, and it was clear to John that that was a feature that would be very useful in the programming languages that targeted .NET and in .NET itself. So he set himself the task of designing how to do that. Um, and so there was periods of research. Um, and then, uh, so a point Don makes is that uh, to, to, to successfully transfer ideas, it's not usually enough to write a paper and publish it at your favorite conference and then let the rest of the world pick it up and, and implement it. Um, and you might think it, you know, that researchers say in Microsoft have the, the highest standing of anyone in the company because you know, we're researchers and we have PhDs. Turns out that's not the case, unfortunately. You know, inside a company like Microsoft, the developers are the highest status because they actually make the stuff that, that we sell um, and researchers are sort of on the side. So if a researcher comes up with a great idea like how to add uh, generics to .NET, it's kind of unlikely that anything at all will happen unless that researcher themselves goes ahead and actually implements it and, and goes through the process of getting it into the hands of, uh, of, of the developers in the, uh, the development team, in the product team that were actually going to ship it. So this is what Don did. So, I mean, he, he had periods of his career when he wrote hardly any papers at all, but went all in, as he puts it, where he basically spent all his, he kind of embedded himself in the product group. I mean, he was physically in Cambridge, but, but I mean, he was like online and, uh, you know, up in the evenings making phone calls and, and really spent a lot of time uh, building trust with the, with the developers. And he did that with .NET Generics and then later on this language F Sharp that you've seen. Um, and to be successful, you have to, you have to build up trust so that people realize that you're in the product group that you're trying to influence. Uh, that, they're at, that, that, you're, um, that you're not messing them around, that you're, you're, you're committed, you're actually going to deliver on what you've, uh, you, you've said, and he, you need to show respect to them. Uh, you, know, you need to be opportunistic about finding problems that actually make sense to the, uh, the, the product group as, a, as opposed to simply being of, of, of academic interest uh, and, and really, really get involved. Uh, so this is advice that he has about how you know, to be uh, successful in terms of tech transfer. Now, this is in the context of a, a corporate lab attached to a huge uh, company with meta, many product groups. But really, what I'm saying here would equally well apply to people in, in universities where you know, the product group, or the, going all in could be like doing a startup. You know, you've, you've had a great idea for something, and you see there's going to be a market for it. Well, hey, it, it, it won't happen unless you do it. Um, or at least you've got an opportunity to be the guy who does the, the company. So you know, lots, of company, lots of startups come out of universities, and, and it's, it has a similar sort of feel to, uh, to, to, to this. Okay, so that's one example. Coming back to some abstractions and criteria, you know, we, we, I'm saying you need to find and articulate something you're going to do, an important problem. Well, uh, what next? Well, it's not, 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 I mean, certainly write down a slogan, what it is you're trying to do, a single sentence, but it's good also to look at different aspects of what it is you're trying to do. So you should certainly write down what you're trying to do, but, but Helmile here, who was... Uh, He's an engineer, and he was with the DARPA program at the U.S. Department of Defense in the 70s, and he was around there when they were funding, uh, you know, ARPANET, Internet-type type activities. And he, he mandated that uh, all, the, the, all the sort of the, the folks running research programs at, at DARPA would use this checklist to evaluate how different projects were going. So this is not a checklist for a single paper. It's more like a big research uh, uh, project. So what are you trying to do? You know, what's the competition? How is it done today? Uh, what would be new? You know, who would actually care about it? How many people would care about it? That's a very interesting thought. You know, is it like 10, 10 researchers or is it like 100 million users of Excel or something? Um, if you're successful, what difference will it make? Sometimes known as impact. Uh, how much, you know, what are the risks? What will the cost? How long will it take? And what are the midterm and final exams? I, there's always a sequence of events. It's, it's very, very rarely you can do anything like anything big, like a rocket or, you know, a big bit of software in, in one milestone. You've got to have intermediate milestones. So you need to have a plan. So I think it's a great checklist to apply. And if you think about it, this could apply to almost any enterprise, but it definitely applies to the enterprise of setting uh, uh, research goals. Okay. Um, but, but where are you going to get the ideas at all? So I'm not going to go into the details of this, but... There are, there are various people who have 
look, looked carefully at successful scientists in the past and considered how it was they were having impact, how, how it was they came up with, with, with different ideas, whether they looked very closely at, at one particular aspect of a plant uh, or whether they, were, whether they, they got lucky with, with serendipity and how it was they, they came to, to get lucky. So I'd recommend this book. Uh, and this guy, uh, Johnson, Stephen Johnson, um, has a great TED talk about how to generate good ideas. And this is a kind of summary of it. But, so I'm not going to go into it. But I say, you know, no, no, no tactics for, for creative ideas. Another thing, seek criticism. Heavens, it, you know, this is a, it's a tough career, you know. There's a lot of bright people around. And sometimes it's tempting to sort of, you know, hide your ideas away and, and not seek uh, and, and not get comments until maybe eventually you submit to a conference or, or whatever. I mean, that's a bad idea. It's much better to, to seek out criticism early. Um, this, this guy is uh, Wheeler, John Wheeler, who, who was a physicist. He invented the term black hole. Um, and, and his slogan is, the fundamental problem is to make the mistakes as fast as possible. Generate lots of ideas. Some of them are going to be mistakes. You know, try them out. Get criticism. It's very easy to fool yourself, but, well, I'll come to that. So it's good to write a research proposal. Um, uh, sometimes, in, so there's a thing here in MSR research, uh, in, in Microsoft Research, we generally don't have to write research proposals, and I'm afraid we're kind of lazy and we think that's a good thing. But I think that's the opposite. I think it is a good idea to write research proposals because it, it forces you to, uh, to get feedback, to say what you're going to do. Uh, and so in a sense, people in universities have an advantage because you, in order to get funding, you have to, to, have to write research grants. Reviews. Uh, so midterm review, you, you, you've done a bit of work, get some folk in, give a talk about it, discuss where you're going, what's gone well, what's gone badly. That's also a really good idea. It's easy to fool yourself whether things are going well. It's harder to, if you've got some folks in to, uh, to convince them. Uh, and failure is good. It's the same kind of idea. Uh, you, you want to learn from your failures. Almost everything fails to start off with, and you need to adapt. Uh, any researcher who's never failed is not pushing the envelope. So I get to pick up this picture of of Roger and the founder of the company. So Roger Needham is the founder of this lab. Bill, of course, the founder of this company. This is Bill and Roger on uh, about 10 years ago. And Roger, when he was, when he was here, he, he used to say he, he loved it that he'd been told by the folks who hired him that if all your researchers' projects succeed, then you have failed as a manager because you've not encouraged them to take enough risks. You know, so if, you're not, if, you, if you don't fail, you know, you've, you've not taken big enough risks. OK. Um, don't we seduce by proxies? So this is an interesting idea that, you know, there's lots of metrics. Scientists, we love to, to count ourselves. Our university administrators love to count metrics about how people are doing in terms of numbers of papers, of sort of esteem factors, uh, membership of program committees, citations and downloads. And, and these are proxies, right? This isn't, this, this isn't the important research task that you have in mind. This is not the thing you're trying to accomplish. These are proxies that other people are using to assess how well you are doing towards those goals. You know, on your deathbed, you are not going to think, gosh, I wish I'd had another 100 citations. You know, it's, th these, are not the, th these are not important. But people, unfortunately, do you know, use them as metrics. Uh, and another, so, so, you know, sometimes these are forced on us, but don't take them too seriously. Uh, another point is that after any project, there's always something you can count that makes it look good. Um, it's kind of harder at the start of a project sometimes to anticipate which one of these measures is going to be the success factor. The general point is, do less, do it well, don't worry so much about these particular numbers, care much more about whether what you're doing is you know, an important you know, research uh, topic. Work with the system. Uh, so this is, uh, so there's, 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 I think there's often you know, uh, sort of overlooked resources in the system that you could, that you could use. So like if you're a university, obviously you can apply to funding bodies to get grants. But also there's a, there's a huge amount of cognitive surplus, as, as Clay Shirky uh, speaks about in the world. That's just the idea that we've got, you know, people have got an awful lot of leisure time. Um, and they, they used to sort of, you know, spend it all watching television. Um, but there's a lot of, you know, highly educated people who are, you know, available on the internet who you could reach out to and um, they can help with your research. So certainly the open source community uh, is one example of that, people who volunteer their time. And you can use that, that energy, if you can harness it, to, uh, to further your research goals. And there's lots of specialist interest groups like, uh, you know, say I, I work in computer security, there's a lot of specialist interest groups who, who look at, uh, you know, there's OWASP that look at, say, web application vulnerabilities and in their own time uh, 
uh, look at uh, cataloging these and I prepare to try out schemes. So if you, if you can get in touch with them, give talks to them, uh, you can, uh, you, you, that can really be a useful feedback and, and, and extra reach for your research. Or say the F-sharp users group, another example. So you know, Don, when he was like, pushing F-sharp, made sure that he encouraged uh, a community of people around his, uh, around his tooling. Um, and in the context of Microsoft, I just put something up there. This probably exists in other companies, but there's something called the Microsoft Garage, um, which is a kind of after-hours uh, uh, sort of hobby group for Microsoft developers, where there's lots of really high, highly trained Microsoft developers kind of would like to help out with things. So say the .NET Gadgeteer folks um, have uh, made use of, of, of them. So I mean, they're not part of the official Microsoft structure, but they're there, you can contact them, and they can, they're a bit like a sort of open source community within Microsoft. Um, I have another example, this is a sort of negative example, which is work with the system, don't fight it. Some people get really crutchety about the system and they want to have a, a blackboard rather than a whiteboard. Um, or they, uh, they, they, uh, they, they, they get upset about timetabling or whatever. Um, you know, you, you need to pick your battles. I mean, there's a system, a certain aspect in a university, there's administrations and so on, and Microsoft is a little bit of bureaucracy as well. You know, it's possible to you know, go all out to fight that. You know, uh, but really, it, it, you know, I mean, what do you want to be? Do you want to be the person who changes that system or do you want to be a, a first-class scientist? I mean, that's another quote from Richard Hamming, and he points out that few people have the talent to do both really well. Um, and I think in this room, we have people who want to be great scientists. One other example of working with the system. So this is, so this is a fine-looking young man, uh, just finished his PhD many years ago. Uh, so uh, someone told me that, uh, American universities have got lots of money to invite people to come and give talks. And they said, why don't, you, why don't you just go invite yourself? So I had a paper in Boston, and I sort of knew someone at Yale University, and I had a friend in Washington, this is me, that's the Watergate building, and, I, and there was a, I wanted to give a talk in Chicago. So basically I went to a whole bunch of, I used email, I just put myself forward and said, hello, I'm Andy Gordon, I name dropped a bit, people I work with said, can I come and give a talk? And lo and behold, they paid, they invited me, and I showed up. They even gave me honorariums. I was astonished. I showed up. I invited myself to give a talk for one hour, my standard talk. And they gave me like 200 bucks. Brilliant. I, I spent uh, about two, three months traveling around the States after my PhD, just chilling out. So uh, I, I don't know many other people who did this, strangely enough, but, really, but possibly because it's not talked about. But, you know, think about that. When you've got time after you finish your PhD, just invite yourself. Uh, <laughs> And if at any point, I think it's just a good strategy, invite yourself. If, you're, if, you're, uh, if you think, I, I'd someone say to me, Andy, no one ever asked me to be on a program committee. And I said, okay, you've just asked me, so next time I'm running a conference, I'll ask you to be on my program committee. Just ask people. You know, if you want to get ahead, you know, go up the ladder, ask people. It's amazing what people would do if you just ask them. Or think about Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook. How did he get all that data? He just asked. Okay, I'm... Uh, Okay, I've got a few more slides about, about balance. Um, okay, uh, we have amazing jobs, but it's super demanding, super anxious making. You, as well as all this serious stuff about picking the important problems and working hard and all that, we also spend a bit of effort on keeping ourselves together, you know, keeping our sort of body and soul together. Get out of the lab, Alan Turing, long distance runner, He's one of our heroes. We're remembering him this year. You know, he, he'd, he'd a balanced life. You know, he, he did a lot of running. This is Alan Perlis, the first ever winner of the ACM uh, Turing Award back in 1966. He was a programming language guy, contributed to, uh, contributed to Algol. Um, and he, there's a nice quote. I'm abbreviating it here. He's, he's speaking about his experiences of computing, that when it started, there were no paying customers, and it was just a huge amount of fun, you know, getting programs to work. And I think we all of us feel it the same way. That's why we're here. It, computers are amazing, amazing fun. We should never lose sight of that. Um, and, and he was lamenting that as things got more commercial, it became a bit more serious and we're worried about paying customers. Well, I say, he says, keep the fun in the house. And I think that's, that, that's something we should always remember. When I joined Microsoft, uh, they, said, they, they said, so you're going to take Bill Schilling? I said, yeah, I'll take Bill Schilling. And uh, the guy who hired me said, well, let's keep the fun in the house. Uh, which we've, we've tried to remember. Sometimes you forget with conference deadlines. And finally, Kathleen Fisher. She has a great talk about maintaining balance, which is at this URL here. Uh, uh, and these slides are going to be in the web, so 
you, you can find that. And I, I don't have time to go through this, but she's a great half-hour talk about, about how to organize your life, how to do time management as a researcher, how to sort of balance the ebbs and flows of, of pressure. And I highly recommend yeah, you, you looking at that. One final thing that I, I, life, um, life does get very busy. So uh, this was doing the rounds on Facebook uh, a few months ago and really kind of, I don't know, got to me a bit. The five regrets to the dying. So this lady, uh, Bronnie Ware, uh, was a nurse in a hospice. And so, you know, you sometimes think, well, what would it be like when I die? What, what would I re regret? Well, she was actually meeting people who were in a hospice and speaking to them about what, about what they had regretted um, about their lives. And um, she said, um, I, wish I, hadn't, I wish I hadn't worked so hard. So every single man, she said, that she was nursing as he was dying was saying that he wished he hadn't worked so hard. Um, and I fear that our subject is very pressured uh, and does make us work very hard. So I, 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 I find this, uh, well, this helps me keep that in mind and uh, try not to work quite so hard. Okay, my last slide. Here's a summary uh, of the different things I've spoken about. This has been on the web. And one final thing, one slogan uh, to, to finish things and give them to people. I think that sums up what I'm, I'm trying to say. That it's, it's easy to start lots of projects. I think you should choose carefully which ones are really working and then you know, take time to finish them really well and get them out there, give them to people so that uh, we made the, the world a, a better and fun place. Thank you.